Welcome to The Old Man and the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 175. Cam Johnson. Cam is a lovely young man who hails from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, decided to go to a terrible school for a couple years down in Chapel Hill. Um, but overall, he's a good human being. And despite the fact that he's a Tar Heel, uh, we decided we should have him on the podcast. And now he's a local. Now he's a neighbor. Just a neighbor stopping by the studio to have some fun. Tommy, big uh, big weekend for me. Um, didn't really get to to cash in my new purchase, but uh, I got fitted for uh, golf clubs, new golf clubs. Uh, on Thursday and picked them up Saturday. Uh, shout out to Titleist, T-150s, gotta love it. Uh, shout out to Kirk, my guy at Pete's Golf Shop, uh, for an absolutely wonderful fitting experience. This is not a paid you, ad. I you, am just very excited can about you, my new Can clubs. you walk us through what a fitting experience entails? Yeah, I mean, you hit a few balls. No, actually, in this case, I hit a lot of balls and I got very tired, but you hit some balls with your old clubs and... You know, he looks at the lie angles, the loft angles, uh, the shaft length and weight. Um, essentially, you know, I was playing with the wrong equipment. Not that my swing is any better after this uh, this fitting, but so were you expect? Are we going to get a jump? I, I mean, I hit I hit some balls this weekend, even in the rain and the wind. Shout out to the hurricane or tropical storm, what's whatever the it was. Next, what's no the, one's going to stop me from using my new next, clubs. What's the next destination that is confirmed that we can actually talk about that you're definitely doing? Ooh, ooh. Um, for sure, next week, uh, I got a little action at Somerset Hills in New Jersey. And I've got a, uh, the following week, I've got the member guest at a place called Wingfoot, um, which is a somewhat famous it's golf course. I am not a member. I, to be clear, I'm the guest going. I'm the guest. But going. so, if you go and you play badly, is it the clubs? Like, is there is is this a no? Thing? It's I, that I suck. <laughs> like, let's be clear. Let's be clear. I think they're going to be crispy. I really do. I think, you know, I I, th- I just I'm a big fan of the the new Titleist. Shout Again, out, not a paid out, sponsor. Shout out to Kurt. I, I got. I paid. Not a paid sponsor yet. <laughs> I, I paid all the money. All the money for the set of clubs. All the money. Uh, all right. Cam, very interesting. We're going to talk to him about a bunch of stuff uh, on this pod. Uh, you know, one of the things that I find interesting about this team in particular, the Brooklyn Nets, of course, this team in particular is what does this season look like in terms of, uh, I, I don't want to call it a bounce back season, but it's it's the next evolution of this franchise and this group. Um you know, not to get into specifics here, but there were opportunities to trade uh, some of their young guys and completely rebuild this thing. And that's not to say they may be going a different direction in the future, but they brought this group back that finished the season last year. Mikel, Cam Johnson, um, you know, the word is, uh, at least on Twitter, is that Ben Simmons playing five on five and is full tilt, ready to go. Um, love Jacques Vaughn. I've spoken about him a number of times. Uh, just a fantastic coach and human being. Um, it's, I, they're, they're interesting to me. I, I don't know yeah. that they're going to be great, but they're interesting. Well, they are, they are built around defense. They have the potential in theory between Mikhail, Ben, you know, obviously in the past, Nick Claxton. and then Nick Claxton, you've, yep. you have potentially, you know, three first or second all defense type players. Now do those guys, does that fit together? Who right. knows? I mean, I don't know if that is a thing that meshes, but in, in theory, the defense should be really, really good. Yeah. And. You know, in terms of the the smaller, undersized guards who that they've been playing <clears throat> the last couple of years, uh, you know, off and on. Joe Harris has been hurt. Seth Seth was hurt for a while. Patty, of course, like all of those guys are gone now. And Cam uh, will have not that he didn't have a bigger responsibility than he had in Phoenix, and we're going to get into that with him. Uh, but he'll have an opportunity, as I said the other day on the old man of the three things. To have a big a big season, especially I think if if Ben Simmons is healthy. All right, let's get to our conversation with Brooklyn Net Cam Johnson. All right, let's welcome in our neighbor Cam Johnson of the Brooklyn Nets. Cam, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for stopping by the studio. Thank you for having me, man, and thank you for welcoming me to the neighborhood. It's, it's great. Cam was great uh, before we started. Spent some time with Knox and Kai. Signed Kai's uh, Cam Johnson jersey. You're an upstanding individual. I appreciate that. I really do. I Thank really you, do. Despite Thank the you. fact, we're going to start here because we have to, despite the fact that you went to UNC, and I know you started a pit, but why the fuck did you go to UNC? Let's get right into it then. 
Uh, Carolina, you know, I've been played against them multiple times before transferring. It's just style of play that I like, you know, thought I could be really success- successful in. And, um, you know, love Coach Roy and, and the guys that were there. And it's as simple as that, you know. So the, the, the uh, getting adopted into the rivalry, you know, later in college, like you're not born into it. You know, I had plenty of college experience. And then I'm like, boom, huge rivalry. So, you know, it took me a second, you know, I was like learning, learning, learning. And man, is it crazy. Everywhere you go in North Carolina, people have something to say. Um, but I loved it, man. I, lo- I love those games. And, you know, we had some good ones. I'm going to ask you about a specific game. I, I do want to ask you about the experience of the rivalry being in North Carolina. Because did you feel, because I always felt like UNC people hated me and hated Duke. Did you feel like Duke hated UNC? Or they, they just made it a rivalry? Because I think there's a difference Let's there. Let's clear it up. When, when we're talking about you specifically, <laughs> that's going to heat things up a lot more, man. Okay. I mean, in That's terms very of, fair. It's a, in terms of most a, this polarizing is college athletes, you were loved or hated right. strongly one way or another. So that's did a you have an, Did you have an opinion when you were younger? I actually didn't. I didn't. I wasn't in the love crew. I wasn't in the hate crew. Um, I just watched. But I... I just remember thinking it was crazy. I'd probably actually probably lean more. No, I can't say that. I can't say I lean one way or the other. Yeah. It's like, I just, you know, enjoyed the. Have we had a player on who's admitted to hating you? We've had a bunch of guys on who were like, we were, they were fans growing up. Trey to- Murphy. Trey Murphy. <laughs> but Trey Murphy's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that's. Yeah. I the don't, I don't the think- hate is not, it's, it, there is a, there is a, a respect. There is 100%. definitely a respect between the programs and 100%. between the especially schools. The, especially the people that have been a part of, like, actually exactly. lived the games exactly. and lived the rivalry. Now, there will be fans that get crazy for sure. Yeah. There will be fans that say stuff, get crazy. But, like, I've seen the hate part of it, and, and that's NC State. They just, their hearts are just, you know, black. They're wicked. <laughs> One of the games I wanted to ask you about was the, the Zion shoe game. Yeah. Um, because you were there, they were the number one team in the country. RJ's on the team as well. You know, the top recruiting class, Zion's projected number one. Game had a massive amount of hype, and Zion busts his shoe and sprains his knee, whatever, 10 seconds into the game. First possession. Yeah, you guys <clears throat> you guys won. <clears throat> you had 26 points. Didn't like you a lot that night. I watched that game. Okay. Don't watch them all, but I did watch that game. Um, the hype around that Duke team and specifically being in the same conference with Zion that year, what was that like? We didn't care too much about it. We saw the hype. We were like, whatever, man. Like, we'll, we'll play them. We'll see them soon enough. Like, you know, we'll see them soon enough, and we'll have some for them. Um, and that game, like, that game was huge. That game was, a, I just, I remember every detail of that day. Like, I remember the entire day. I remember warm-ups. I remember pregame. I remember tying my shoes before the game. Like, you know, just, it flow, was. Flow state? Like flow state. Flow state. The Definitely whole day. flow state. The whole day. Obama was there, right? Obama was there. Like, it was everything. And then first possession, he comes and busts his shoe. And then I go down and get a layup out of it. They keep showing the highlight. They never show my layup. <laughs> they never show that. But, uh, yeah. And then we just steamrolled them from there. You know, they definitely, wind was taken out of their sails. The building deflated. And that was the most gratifying part of it. Because the year prior, it was senior night um, at Duke to determine who get who gets the two seed in the ACC tournament, we're up 14 in the second half, and they come back and beat us. And they kind of went up like six, I think. Grayson hit a three in, in the second half, and the crowd went crazy. Loudest I've ever heard any environment in my life to the point where, and you know this because you've been there a million times, but the floor starts shaking underneath your feet. Mm-hmm. And so, like, the vibration in the air, like, you can't even make out the words you're speaking. You know what I mean? So it's like I'm speaking, but I don't even know if words are being produced. And that moment, like those moments as the clock was winding down, like was just so deflating because, you know, it was a game you should win. Every game between Duke and Carolina is like life and death, you feel like. Um, But man, like you're sitting there questioning everything, like after the game. And as the clock goes to zero, you're like, where do we go wrong? So to turn around the next year, last game I'm ever playing there, beat them by 20. The crowd is quiet starting with like, four minutes left in the game. So the last four minutes of the game, we're just laughing, having fun, really just taking in the moment. That was that was awesome. There were certain days where I just didn't want to be on campus after a loss. And 
I think I was six. No, I know I was six, six and three against Carolina. Those three days, I didn't want to be on campus. Maryland losing to them. Oh man, the other losses, I, I know the story. The other losses, I, know I was the, just like Maryland was. Yeah, I was just like, oh, uh, yeah, Maryland we lost. Probably, Next game, oh. those ones stung a little bit. You you mentioned the the crowd at Cameron. I personally think this, and you know, I I played in the NBA Finals. I played playoff games in Boston. I right. played a bunch of college arenas, all that stuff. But I don't think there's a better environment in terms of noise, intimacy. You got one? No. I mean, you said better. But I don't think there's a better one. There's the not a louder one, and there's yeah. not a more intimate one. But do I classify it as yeah, like? How do you define? How do you define yeah, best? How do you define best? Because, and I said this before, Cameron seats. <clears throat> they claim nine thousand, right? They claim. they they put nine thousand. So nine thousand three hundred seventy four, something like that. Something like that. But it, you walk in there, and it looks like it should only seat six. Right. So I was like, bro, how are they getting all these people in here? It's because everybody's turned to the side. Everybody's packed together. And I've said this before. They definitely violating some health codes over there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just <laughs> look the other way. <laughs> they're, but, they're greasing the fire marshal. Yeah, and and ceilings low. Like hoops hanging from the ceiling. Come on, man. Like. It's high school, <laughs> right? Again, right? That's the intimacy. Exactly. That's the better environment. Like I twisted my ankle on press row in that yeah. game my senior year, and I was so mad. Like I was about ready to take his camera and throw it to the ceiling into the top row because you, you can a, do that there. Did you have a low key in, like an environment that was crazier than you expected in college? In college? No, not off the top of my head. They all kind of rang up to, and I don't yeah. know. I spent five years, so it's like there's no surprises by the end. Yeah. Um, actually. We played a game at Wofford my senior year to open the season. And obviously, they like brand new facility, like brand new arena. It's like a 3,000, 4,000 seater. And they had that place turned up, man. Was and Fletcher, those Wofford, was yeah, yeah, yeah. Fletcher McGee on right, the team? Right. Yeah. Good team. Storm Murphy, Fletcher McGee, um, the big guy Jackson. Like they have really good teams. And yeah. they almost beat Kentucky in the tournament that year. Fletcher so they, probably took 18 threes. Uh, yeah, 20 maybe. I don't know. He just <laughs> runs and shoots them. <laughs> Is it, by the way, this is totally off topic on Fletcher McGee. Uh, I called one of his uh, summer league games this yeah. year, and I had forgotten. Like I jumped forward when I shot threes, and I got a lot of four point plays that 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 way. Um, Jamal d did it a little bit. James Harden does it a little bit. I think most guys that get a lot of four point plays, they naturally shoot forward. That dude launches himself forward. What does it's he? the most unorthodox? Like and he from and point he A to point too, B, but he's. Yeah. He, cash. He, he cash they beat us the year before oh wow they beat us in chapel hill my junior i remember year. that yeah. yeah my first game is a tar heel i missed the first 10 games with a knee surgery my first game is a tar heel and this this one's this one's gonna sound bad i'm walking through the hallway with roy pregame or after shooting around and he's like first game back you know you, you, you're just you're just getting back into the flow of things you know i think i'm gonna play you about Six to eight minutes tonight. It's a team that, you know, we're much more talented than. Should be easy for us. I just want to ease you in. Next thing you know, I'm like 20 minutes deep into the game. He's like, are you okay? Like, we need you to win. Like, I'm like, yeah, oh, I'm Roy fine. Did, Roy didn't want to take that L. Right. Oh, man. So L. I'm like, my first game is a Tar Heel. We lost to Wofford at home. We're number five in the country. Lost to Wofford. I'm like, bro, what is going on here? Good times, good times in the triangle area. Good, good times. times. In the What's your? Tell what, me what. Tell me what you said before the. Just say it. I, I said something about an inferiority complex. Infer and, he and, claimed Carolina has an inferiority <laughs> complex, and I wasn't even going to throw the insult back. I'm a. I'm going to just deflect. Deflect that one straight over to the boys in Raleigh, and me and Dennis Smith were talking about this today and yesterday, and, and we'll continue to talk about this, but. That's the inferiority right there. Like they feel it. NC they State, live yeah. it. NC where does State. Wake where does Wake fit into this? I mean, Wake's like a small private school. It's not not in the conversation. It's not it's not it, the same. It's not the same. Like, okay, so NC State has some sort of heavy pride. Like they think they should belong. So they'll pack out their their arena every time. There'll be no blue in there. You know? Wake, last time I played there as a senior, the whole entire place, like 70% Carolina. And it was like a home game. We scored, crowd going crazy. When I so when, it's like wake yeah. wake basketball's had its highs, but right they now they had their highs. It's, it's when I was in school for, there, the, that place was lit. Oh they my used God, to play no, that whatever that techno music was. Yeah. They all wore the black and yellow. And I hate when they things, bring out the, uh, the motorcycle, the fumes, the fumes in the air, in front like of the bench during the starting line. Over there, like like my warm up <laughs> over my face. 
Oh, it's. I mean, see, dude, that I was there when CP was there. Like, yeah, that's, that was those they, are they were, that's pri- that's peak Wake. Those are teams what, are good. What's your what's your perspective now, looking back on the the drama leaving Pitt? Everything that I argued for, everything that I was standing for, is kind of the direction college athletics was going. So my whole thing when I was leaving, when they put the restriction on me, was like I was just like that's not like how is this right? You know, like two returning players to my pit team. It's a new coach. I've, we've had three three athletic directors in my time. The the team, the school colors changed. Like it's a new place, <laughs> and I graduated. So it's like. I fulfilled my obligation. I graduated from the school. Like, well, how can you guys handcuff me as to where I, where where I can go? So I just kind of fought that fight, and, and you know, with with no real end goal in sight in specific, other than the fact that like I just felt it was wrong. You were seventeen or eighteen, I assume, when you signed your letter of intent. Eighteen. Okay, eighteen. So right, you're eighteen years old. I made a decision. I, I fulfilled my fulfilled obligation. My, exactly. Obligations. And I tried to represent the university to the best of my abilities. And it was just like a completely different situation at the time. You know, it was like nobody from the teams that I played with. So that was that. And, and, you know, I was never, never, ever, ever dragging Pitt through the mud. You know, I was never any slight against Pitt. I love, I love the school. I love my time there. I would not have gotten anywhere without having that essential step. So it was never any, you know what I mean? So I got I've gotten a lot of hate from from pit people like I, they kind of disowned me. For, who was the who was the coach the new coach? The new coach there? now or the no, coach the that coach, I had? The coach that when that took over when you left. Kevin Stallings was there, but I I played a year under Kevin. Yeah, I played two under Jamie Dixon, one under Kevin Stallings. Kevin Stallings got I left. Kevin Stallings had one more year. They had a really bad year. Yeah, I didn't win a conference game, which is part of the reason. Like I'm I'm not trying to get. And then me. Jeff was there. And then Jeff. So you. You left before Jeff I left got before there. Jeff. I just wanted to clarify I that. I played against Jeff. I played at, right. at Carolina. I played one season against Pitt where Stallings was a coach. I played one season against Pitt where I just Hayward wanted to coach. clarify that you didn't leave because Jeff Capel, a Duke guy, was coming to Pitt, and then you left Pitt to go to UNC. I just wanted a clarification yeah, that, on the yes, timeline. Yes, yes, yeah. We're not going to start that one. I need to one. understand. Just go down the road. But I like, I like Jeff. And I think oh, he's, I think he's doing a, a good job over there right now. You know, they, they, you know, and I think they're pouring into the basketball program, which, you know, I, I like to see as an alum. We had uh we had dinner with you and some folks uh, last week yeah. at Lucali, and I know we had uh a, you know a, a little discussion about USA ba- basketball. But I want to dive a, a little bit deeper into that and have our listeners get some insight from you about that experience. Um, you know, I I kind of I don't want to say I defended you guys and the result, but I, I tried on the podcast to, I think, provide a little bit of context and whether you want to call it an excuse or not, I said, look, you know, here's the roster. Here are some players that could have been on the team. You look across the world and not everybody showed up, but a lot of the best players for their country showed up. Um, FIBA is a different thing, right? Uh, I think what's interesting is taking a step back in your role versus what a lot of guys who go play for their national team, they get to take a step up in terms of their role. And that's an adjustment um, on the, on, on those two things. I don't want to get into the roster cause I don't really give a shit about that, but like on those two things, the FIBA rules and how that game is played. And also just what I'm talking about in terms of roles and kind of figuring it, that out in three or four weeks, just the, the difficulty and the experience of trying to do that and win at the highest level. Yeah. I, uh, Firstly, there, there's no excuse for not winning. Right? I didn't say not. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm not gonna def- like. I, yeah. it, it hurts us individually, collectively as much as more than anybody. You know, it's disappointing. You, we put you know you put a lot of time into those things, and you want the outcome that you want. You don't get it. It's very frustrating. <sighs> FIBA's a different game. FIBA's a, just a it's a different game, and like you see guys playing for their for their national teams like you said they're 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 you can't treat them like the, the players there on the nba you just can't you know and the, just the flow of the game the way it's played the way it's officiated uh, minor rule changes it's it's different and there's different focuses you know when you're playing a team. everybody in the nba sort of plays a very similar style of basketball like there has been a style of basketball that analytically or, you know, success-wise has dictated how other teams... For, you know, for pretty much your whole career. And it's That's a copycat everybody's league. Everybody's kind of played it's a copy, in a similar It's a copycat way. league. Yeah, Eventually, 100%. everything's going to catch up and, and, and evolve. 
But FIBA, you know, the physicality is different. The way they play is different. And they don't really care, you know, how the game's played in the NBA. They're going to play They're going to play their way. So it was a super interesting experience to see that. And, I, you know, it opened our eyes quickly as we're playing against Slovenia and Spain in those exhibition games that they're, like, those teams run offenses very efficiently. Like, you can tell they've been playing together for a long time. So it's like, okay, this is what this is what we're in store for. Also, they crash the glass like – you know, nobody's business and, and, and they're just efficient. Like they're, they're, they're accountable. They play hard. They play for each other. Um, so I, on a basketball, like on just a pure basketball side of things, like it's beautiful to watch, right? Like, you know, it's basketball globally, you know, everybody's speaking different languages. Everybody looks completely different and everybody's able to kind of play their own style of basketball. Um, so it, I do think, obviously, our even the group, you know, people say we didn't have this, we didn't have that, we should have sent this. You guys had a bunch of awesome NBA players. We so had really be, good I, NBA I, players. I, 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 like, I, I, there's no excuse yeah, not yeah, yeah. to win. Um, yeah. But just the nature, it's basketball, the nature of the game. Like, you know, it, I think that the, the, you, you, you've said all these three things, and I just want to point them out in yeah. sort of, not necessarily in order, but just to kind of comment on them. So first, you mentioned the offensive rebounding. And it's interesting you, when you talk about a copycat league in the NBA. For the last probably eight to 10 years, almost every team outside of the five men has punted on offensive rebounding. Now, in the name of transition defense. In the name of transition defense. Now, a couple of teams, I've seen some stuff, of course, uh, you know, coaches giving quotes about how we want to play differently this year. I think there could be a reversion back to. All right, we might send two or three guys yeah. to the offensive glass, especially yeah. with the amount of threes. Like, why are you getting back? Right. There's opportunities to get rebounds. Right. Um, but that was apparent, right? That when watching the games, I said, "Oh, this is different." The flow that you talked about, that was eye opening. Because um, we watch, I watch, I don't watch Euro League. Like, I, I I watch full FIBA games once every three or four years, right? Right. right. And you get so locked into watching the NBA, the timeout situation. Uh, the fouls, uh, you know, the the offensive flow, I think, is huge. And that was the third thing I was just going to say, like, when you talk about the offense, the NBA, and I thought at times our team, right, uh, would run an action, and then that's the possession. And you watch some of these te teams play, there's an action that leads to another action that leads to another action, and so everybody's like, well, how did Team USA give up this many points? I'm like, because they're defending four or five actions on a possession. I'm sorry. Like, I'm not, this again, this is not an excuse. Not an excuse. It is, it's, it, you have a month and it's a learning curve. And as NBA players, how many teams play like that? Maybe one? Right. Maybe, Maybe. Golden State? Maybe. Right. Maybe? It's a different, it's a different thing. So, it, it, yeah, and that's, that's a huge part of it. And, and we understood that. Everybody understands going to FIBA, like, we have six weeks to become a team and that, you know, it's not, we weren't blind to that, but everybody's trying to figure out their role. Everybody's trying to figure out where they, where they lie in the rotation. The coaches are trying to figure it out. You know, it's, it's, there's stuff to it, it that makes it, you know, more difficult than it may seem on the outside. But man, at the end of the day, I, I don't like, I don't feel like we, should have lost, you know, we lost by two points and, you know, we lost by Lithuan to Lithuania by five points. You know, it's Canada went to overtime. These are not like runaway games. These are games where uh, Germany against Germany, Obst, their three-point shooter, had nine foul shots off of threes. Yeah. You know, like just three little plays. subtleties of the game. Three plays. You know what I mean? Little yeah. subtleties of the game. Minor lapses in what we're trying to accomplish, um, and they scored 113 points in a 40 minute game, or whatever it was, 110 plus points in a 40 minute game. And credit to those teams for being able to take advantage of those things. But you know, it's it, it is eye opening to the game of basketball because you get so conditioned. 82 games of NBA basketball, you're watching film every single day. You're watching games every single day. We consume hundreds of games, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of games of NBA basketball yearly that our brains get so conditioned to just thinking that's how we play. You know, that's yeah. just, oh, everybody, you know, everybody plays. Like <laughs> do, you think, yeah. do you think it tricks the, not just fans, but media, whoever, observers, when they see a guy like Valanchunas, like think about the Lithuania game, he just, he plays differently in FIBA because the, the rules are different. So he's able to, he's able to play differently. He's there. able to play to exactly what his strengths yes, are. Yes, he's not getting just, targeted on defense the way he would in the NBA because right. of the way the court is set up. Right. And that no defensive three seconds, like mm. it, 
it plays into the way they want to play defense. Yeah. Which is, you know, they, they, they're not out pressuring. They're not, you know what I mean? They're just, the reason, they're we, in the gaps, reason everybody they're, plays five out in the NBA is to allow driving angles and, and the ability to draw a second defender so you can get open threes yep. and, you know, three point lines closer. It just, yeah. just, just the simple optics of a closer three point line shrinks the court. You know, you, you watch, I watch little kids play on courts with, uh, all the lines on them and them kids are standing at the NBA three point line all game, chucking NBA threes. And it's like, bro, that's not your line, but they see the line and that's the, that's where they'll play. So I think it's kind of a similar situation in FIBA. Haven't really asked anybody this that was involved. Um, every year you guys get ready for training camp. There's a select team yep. and there's a week of scrimmages and games yep. between the select team and the senior national team. Um, were there any young guys that, that stood out to you during that run uh, against the select team? Um, I like the group total. I think there's a lot of young talent on that team. I, Kate Cunningham played really well. Yeah. Jalen Duran played really well. And, you know, I, I think somebody like a Jalen Williams is just like he wasn't doing anything spectacular, but he's so solid, skilled, you know, understands the game really well for being young in his career. So those guys did a really good job to me. And I think the team as a whole, like they came in, they played hard. Um, in the scrimmages, and it's like, okay, yeah, the, these kids, these kids are the, these guys are the real deal. Tommy, Jalen Duren, yeah. getting a shout two, out. Two, two, two man, guys. Tommy, re- two guys, Tommy two guys, gave him some love on Monday. Two spot. guys on one team. Yeah, right. Pistons are in good and with, with Coach Monter. They're, they're in good hands. What would you on Cade for a second? Just because we, I feel like we haven't really gotten to see him because of the health stuff. Right. Like, what, how would you describe him right now? For we have a lot of Piston fans who like the show. Like, what should they be looking forward to? Um, I think he's going to have a very solid control of games because he's a big bodied point guard that's able to get to his spots. And I think that's what he's refining as time goes on is just not being able to be sped up, controlling the flow of the game, getting to his spots, being able to score, being able to distribute. And that's the challenge he posed. You know, you put somebody smaller on him and he's definitely going to be able to just kind of get to wherever he wants on the court. You know, so he, he, he looked pretty good in those in those scrimmages. Cam, I didn't. I didn't do this because you were coming on the pod this week. I legitimately uh, had you as one of. Uh, we did a show on Monday. I had you one, as one of my three guys that are, I think are poised for a breakout season. Um, I had a bunch of different reasons why, uh, but one of them was, uh, I think, historically for a lot of guys, they get the FIBA World Cup experience. They get the taste of this. They get to be around some of their peers. They get to be around coaching staffs, whatever. And there's, there's in basketball, there's a learning through osmosis, right? You know, you exactly. see somebody the way they work or you pick up something, a habit, you pick up something in film with a different coach, a different voice in your ear for the first time and things click. I, I'm curious if there were anything that you really took away from this experience in, in a positive way. Cause I know we, we talked about some L's, so I'm, I'm well, I think, a positive way. I think the negative, you know, I think we can, I think I personally can take the negative of, of that feeling of like coming up short as you know a huge learning tool you know because I think back and for me personally you know it's been a long time since I've been disappointed in that way you know you expect to win you expect to play well like you almost kind of take it for granted at a certain point so it's like a real like you know a real kick in the butt like get yourself going get in high gear like turn this thing up you know what I mean because it, it felt in the moment like like a failure you know, it's like, man, we're all the way out here in the Philippines and you were there, man. It was like, we're far, we're and, out there. And, and you got food poisoning. I did get food poisoning. I was down bad for a little bit. But, uh, you know, it's like sometimes you need something like that to just give you a little motivation going into a season. Um, but the positives of it, man, is that's there, there is so much that you could learn just from being around them. You know, Steve, uh, Spo, Ty Lu. Um, you know, I'm Jeff, I'm talking to Jeff Van Gundy every day, Chip England. These are guys that like so much success uh, accumulated between all these coaches and as players also in the NBA, like you learn a lot from them. Um, you learn a lot about their mindset. You learn a lot about the guys that you play with. Um, and, and just establishing those relationships, man, high level basketball for weeks. Like we're, 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 we're scrimmaging each other most practices. So that's like high level scrimmages. I mean, we got. 15, 14 guys, whatever it was, 12 guys that that are really high-level NBA players. So it's really high-level runs. You know what I mean? We get that every day. It, I, I think 
I think that USA, that national team experience bump is, is real. Um, and I think, you know, I think, uh, Mikhail also could, can testify to that, but I appreciated the experience as a whole for a lot of reasons. Yeah. So I think I want to, I want to clarify both my comment and question and what you are saying. It seems to me like you're saying, I didn't just become a better basketball player than I was on August 2nd when I went to Vegas and when I got back. Like, right. it's not just about a six week period. It's really about the long term effect of that experience and what it does to your hunger, your basketball intellect. Maybe you picked up one skill. I don't know, but it, it's all of that. And it's, it's, it's more of a long term thing. We're right. not going to, you know, Cam Johnson is not going to score. Come, right. You don't come <laughs> back six weeks later like a brand new part. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Burnt your last piece of toast? Avocado's gone bad? Or is the hot sauce bottle empty? Try grocery delivery from DoorDash. You'll get everything you want delivered when you need it right to your door. With thousands of grocery stores to choose from, you'll find the best in your neighborhood and boost your local economy with each and every order. You'll get exactly what you ordered or we'll make it right. So sit back and enjoy quality groceries just like you picked them yourself. And Tommy, don't forget the Dash Pass membership, which we use here in the Reddick household. You can save on all your grocery and restaurant favorites with a $0 delivery fee on all eligible orders with a Dash Pass membership. Get 50% off your first DoorDash order up to a $20 value when you use code JJFALL at checkout. Limited time offer, terms apply. That's 50% off up to a $20 no minimum subtotal and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code JJFALL. Don't forget, that's code JJFALL for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. Well, you, well, you mentioned the coaching staff and, and we, we spoke at dinner the other night about a, a couple of them, but I, I wanted to get back to Monty. Um, I played for Monty in Philly. Mm -hmm. He was our associate head coach my second year there. He then took the Phoenix job um, there with you as a rookie. Um, what was sort of the learning curve for you early on, and how did Monty help you with that? And as Tommy mentioned with Detroit, why do you think he's such a good fit for that franchise and that team right now? The reason he's a good fit for Detroit right now, in my opinion, is I look at my experience from day zero as a Phoenix Sun and the way that he's able to communicate, the way that he's able to teach really flattens out that learning curve a lot to the point where you know exactly what he, he wants from you. You know exactly what he wants. He communicates it to you and he's a stickler for details, which I think is huge, huge for habits as a young player. Um, he's, he's on top of every detail and you know, he, he, he'll hold you accountable. And for me personally, I, I viewed Coach Mon as a coach that like, he, I didn't want to let him down. You know what I mean? Like I, I was, and I think those are the coaches that you respond to best, but I mess up an assignment. I, I mess up something we went through in scout and I did that plenty of times my rookie year. And he look at me just like, come on. And I was just like, man, I, I gotta be better. Um, so, you know, I, I just think he, he understands the game well. In terms of his X's and O's, like his ability to drop plays on the fly is, is, is unreal. Like he's drawn up some stuff that has just the easiest passes you can imagine. Um, so I think that Detroit team, everything I heard is, is they're a hungry group, um, willing to buy into what he has. And, and if you buy in, I, he, he, he can turn teams around quick. Were, were you, I can't remember, I, back when Aiden bailed on us a year ago, I watched the play like five times. The eight and buzzer beater yeah. to beat the Clippers. Were you yeah. on the court? Yep. So you were in the huddle. Yes. Not a second wasted when he grabbed the clipboard. <laughs> Not a second wasted. He grabbed that's this is that's a great that's a great question. That's, that's it, the first it, thing that popped in my head. Right. When you said it, that. It, it, it's it directly addresses what I just said. So what is this? This is like a game two game of two, the Western yeah, Conference yeah, yeah. Finals. It's it's basically like a must it's a must win type situation. You want to go up two oh at home. We were down, right? We were down one. And he grabs his clipboard and gets right to, there's no, there's no hesitation. There's no stuttering. There's no erasing. Be like, you over here, you over here. He had this play drawn up in his head. You guys hadn't practiced that play? Never. Oh, actually we might've, we might've had a version of it. A version of it with maybe side out of bounds. I would imagine it was side Against out of bounds. Against Dallas, I think we ran it. So okay. it was a version of it twisted around. Okay. But there was no hesitation. He drew it up. I was in the, I think, ball side corner. And my job was to just take off off of like a false screen towards the opposite, like half court 
area. I don't even, I don't remember specifically, but I took off. Paul George is guarding me. He stuck with me as if I was going to get the ball. I'm over there like, gotcha. Like you're out of the play now. And it, it's it, an underrated it, part of the play, by the way. Yeah. I feel like I get did my job. I got him out. I got him out. Um, and the play was just executed so perfectly. Everything that we talked about, like he's given Jay like, and, and to Jay Crowder's credit, that is the toughest position to be in. inbound. Like inbounders don't, don't get enough credit, like inbounding in late game situations or in situations like that is one of the toughest jobs in the league. Like executing that pass is very difficult. Um, so he's over there talking with Jay, like, okay, the pass needs to come at this timing. You need to you know, put it in this location. He's like, there's no goaltending in these situations. So put it close to the hoop. So DA comes off that, that little, that little pin down screen, easy magic, you know? It, just such a great play call. Expl everybody's job was explained to a T, and and the result was literally the perfect result. So it was like, and, and, and you know, I said we ran a play like that before. I think we, I think it would have been one that we ran against Dallas, that resulted in in a book game winner. So it's like these plays that he draws up, like they they're meeting up there for hours and hours and hours in the coach's office at a time for a reason like they're drawing up these plays hammering them out and and Mont stores them in his brain and he got them ready to fire off at a moment's notice the reason i asked if you'd run the play before it's surprising because i, I know in that form no in that form okay that makes sense because because uh i know when i was with monty and i i had a couple coaches that were like this that were like really good about this i think every team does this to an extent but you have like a late game package yes and once you have, let's say you have five or six late games yes, and you use those situations, you get a new late game package. Because they're scouted. They're, and, they're yeah. known. And so then you you practice those five or six packages, you know, for two weeks, three weeks, whatever. And then once you've used them, you go to the next one, right? And I know Monty was like on, on our little breakdowns when we would go group by group with the four coaches at, at the Sixers practice facility, like he was running the set pieces, right? Mm -hmm. And you're talking about attention to detail. It's, it's a like, skill of his. Oh God, it's so good. Yeah. So that's why it's I think so it's be really beneficial to younger teams because that's a struggle with a younger team. You know, they, they, they got energy, they, they can play hard, they're capable of those things, but attention to detail is, is very hard to pick up. And it's, it, it's even harder to pick up if you don't learn it immediately. You know what I mean? Like if you go a couple years into your career and you establish bad habits as mm. when it comes to NBA basketball, from what I've seen, it just becomes really, really hard to reverse those. Yeah. Do you feel like in in twenty? I feel like the whole the whole country figured out during the bubble run. You know that you guys were sort of building something. Did you guys know beforehand, or did things kind of they kind crystallize of there? Crystallize there. Um, over the course of the season, man, we had lost so many close games. Like typical young team doesn't really know how to close games. Still a work in progress, but we felt like we were in in a lot. So we felt like you know we were building towards something positive, but the practices that we had pre-bubble and when we got there were super high level, super competitive. Guys were, you know, guys were locked in. And I don't, you know, the mindset was just like, and the mindset the entire time was, it don't matter what anybody else do. We have eight games of a season left. Go out and win every one of them. And we can be satisfied with the result if we go out and put our best foot forward every single day of practice, every single night on the court. And so that was where, you know, we, we were a young team. Guys didn't, you know, only one or two guys had kids. So everybody's like, you know, I'm fresh out of college. I'm mean, just like we're back in college, you know? So I was enjoying so it. You got a long AAU trip. And, and exactly. And, the, you know, the, the state of the world at the time, we weren't outside hanging out with friends anyway. So, like, we're able to hang out with our friends and hoop with our friends. Like, we were all just excited to be able to continue our season and be able to continue to play. And I think that, that, you know, looking back, that vantage point alone gave us an advantage because I don't think every team viewed it like that. And so we just kind of took advantage of it and, and, and rolled. And we played hard. We pressed. Yeah. Like, we are picking up full every game. Like, we just wanted to play harder than teams. The the bubble was a great separator of uh, not just teams, but, like, players that actually wanted to be there versus players and teams that didn't want to be there. I do find it fascinating. Th thank you for your service to the NBA, by the way, for you guys coming because i find it fascinating that they made you come to the bubble with, where if if you could go eight no you relatively still, no chance you mathematically still, we had a chance and it and if was if, it three percent it was well, something crazy if like that. brooklyn would have beaten portland right which came down to a karis levert pull-up jump shot yeah then we would have been in a play-in so 
it was, you know. It was a possibility. Yeah. It was definitely, it was a real possibility. You guys did your thing. And also, low-key, the bubble was was not that bad. And uh, you, how how many teams in NBA history have gone out on a win that weren't the, you know, you know? It's like, we felt like we won something. That's it, interesting. It is a we're weird, the only other it, team in the bubble that really felt like we won something. It is a weird what season. if. Yeah. Like, do you, there's no way to obviously, you know, say this definitively, but like, if you just hadn't gone to the bubble... And obviously the trade, we wouldn't have been the same team, but you wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have had the same, the trade with Chris was probably like, okay, this team can make noise. You know, they're probably not as right. He went now hungry. He probably doesn't. Yes. He's not coming to the suns. If, if it weren't for this, like the, the steam built up by the bubble, like it, it would have like, think about it. It would have been really random. Um, Uh, so that, that Jeff generated a lot for us. Obviously the, the expectations changed. Because of the bubble and then the right. trade for Chris, right. I, I find it sort of fascinating. We're just hitting, sitting here talking about Monty and the attention to detail, and then that team ends up adding Chris. You talk about somebody who has insane attention to detail, and I, you know I played with him. I know this. He's a culture builder. Is there anything that early on stands out to you? It doesn't necessarily have to be like a story, but maybe maybe it's a, maybe it's a feeling. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's you. And the younger guys being like, oh, this is totally different than what we've experienced before in terms of, you know, having a player with that level of leadership. Uh, Chris Paul brings a very unique element to a team. Um, and, and, and he's very, very, very critical to the overall flow of a team. So he will run that entire show, you know. Um, so obviously there's an adjustment to the way he plays, but it's not hard because he's going to put you in a, in a very, you know, spot that yeah. you can be successful in, an advantageous position. Um, so uh, there's there's definitely a lot of change associated with that, but we expected that. Now, when we first started that season, I think we started in like a nine and nine. We lost to OKC that who played nobody that night at home. And so we had to sit down with our team like, yeah, we're beating good teams, but we don't have enough attention to detail on these bad teams. Like we can't, we can't lose to you know, these sub 500 teams, we can't have a sub 500 record versus sub 500 teams. Like that's unacceptable. So everybody collectively kind of came together and, 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 and really locked in on, on that. So you have Chris, who's high attention to detail, Mont, whose attention to detail is, you know, high level. And then everybody else is like, all right, is, we got to all turn it on at once. Um, so it, it was a big emphasis as we went down the stretch of that season. And it was a, a huge part of our success was just that whole entire, you know, being, being led by those two, um, you know, it was, it was easy to then pick up the attention to detail. Well, to that, to that point, you know, we haven't really talked about it yet, but we've talked, the three of us have talked about it, the book in particular and the jump that he made. Yeah. At what point, at what point were you like, okay, this is a guy that was like, we knew the talent was there to This is, you know, a premier guard. In the league. When did I, I saw it immediately. I think it was just a matter of circumstance. I mean, so circumstance is funny because it allowed him to fully develop his game at like 19 years old, where he's taken every shot imaginable and put in positions where the, the game is his playground. So you give him that opportunity and then you turn around and put a, a solid team around him. Um, I saw it from day one, like he's just a killer and he has that, you know, he has that about him where he's step on the court every time to, to kill the person in front of him, like straight up. By the way, he had that, his rookie year. Like he can, yeah, he, that's like, I remember. And so he's able to guarding me and like us going at it. He's as competitive as like anyone. Yeah. I, so, I mean that like, he, like legitimately I was like, Oh, this guy, this, whatever it is, like he's he got it. it. Yeah. He's so I, it. I saw it day one and, and, and you know, there was always like a, I think a conversation of like, can he be, you know, a championship, a championship caliber, like number one option? Well, yeah, I think that was proven. Yeah, I think how so. Do you, how do you, how do you, when you're playing against a guy, how do you sort of like make the calculation of like they are a killer versus they're just talking? You know, like what's the, as an like opponent? Easy. Some of it is just result. But I feel like it's kind of easy. Like I remember we had a game in Philly, my first year there. So this was 17, 18. This mm-hmm. is before you were there. And this dude, like, I want to say he had 48, but he might've had 54. And we threw every defender at him. And 
I had been asking this. This is back when I used to guard people. Like I had been asking. I was like Lloyd. Lloyd Pierce was our defensive coach. I was like Lloyd, put me on him. This is a chance, coach. Give, give me a chance. You know, because I'm like I'm watching these guys. They're not into the ball on pick and rolls. Blah blah blah. Anyways, he runs a high pick and roll. I defend it as well as I can defend it, and he picks up the ball and he does that book thing where he like shot, does the Kobe shot fake two or three times and then just launches a three over me off balance, well defended, well contested, mm-hmm. and it goes in. And yeah, then I look at him and I see in his eyes that he's a fucking killer. Like it's not, yeah. it's not rocket science. It right. really isn't. Right. It really is. That's it. And yeah, that's it. That's it right there. Like he, it would, it would be one thing if, but like he goes out, like he, he has a, a very, very elite ability to just score the ball. So like if he was just talking and, you know, it's carrying ex- himself execution. one way with, yeah, yeah it's, it, he has the execution aspect of, it and he's had that. He's always had that. You talked about the, Three plays that uh, the German player got fouled on, yeah. on the, th- the three pointers in that Germany game. Yeah, and I always talk about a couple plays during that twenty-one finals run. Yeah, talk about the Giannis block, yeah, well, which was insane, and then <clears throat> the Drew steal that led to the Giannis lob. Right. Yeah, those two plays go the other way. Maybe you guys don't win the series, but there's a chance you probably do. Right. It, that, I'd this, actually add one more into there. What is it? It's an obscure one. Oh, I like, it was, I like uh, this. Fourth quarter. I and I, I I'm not, you know, I didn't have this one prepared, but I think it was a fourth quarter in game four. We're up maybe six or nine. And there's probably it's probably mid, mid fourth quarter. We get us we force up a tough shot. They miss. PJ Tucker offensive rebound, I think, kick out Pat Connaughton three. Crowd goes crazy. Game gets a lot tighter. It was a point in time where we could have taking the lead to double digits and sat a lot comfier. But the game, all in that one possession, I felt like just tightened up. You know, it became a lot closer than it had seemed the whole entire night. It's weird to, to describe that and to remember that all these years later because how many plays happen in a basketball game? A hundred? Hundreds. There's a hundred There's a hundred possessions. Everybody gets like a hundred possessions, right. right? On average. And you can go back and forth for six minutes, 12 minutes, whether you're up five, down five, as a player, you've done it so many times where like you have a feeling and you can sense the moment. Mm-hmm. And it's it's fascinating that you bring this up two years later as an obscure play, but you remember it. Like that's yeah, a different was, yeah. series if you guys go on to win. If we get that defensive rebound and then, you know, obviously a score would have helped. It's a comp- it's a completely different series. And it was three one is a lot different. I, I bring up those plays not to bring up a sore subject. I bring up those plays because I wanted to bring up a specific play, and that was your dunk on P.J. Tucker in Game 2. And I wanted to ask you why you had the worst celebration I've ever seen of somebody that dunked on somebody. Like, whoa, dude, wait, dude, you didn't show any emotion. All right. And you put your head down, and then you barely gave a high five to a teammate, and you walked the free throw line. It was locked in. It was a <laughs> dope-ass dunk in the yeah, NBA yeah, yeah, Finals, yeah, yeah. bro. All right, so let me – let's <laughs> – Reel it back in for a second. I have funny. Ha ha he he. When have you ever seen me celebrate anything in a, on a court? Fair I point. I just don't. Fair like, point. It's, just, it's the not silent, on my he's brain. The silent it's, not, assassin. it's not front and center in my mind. When it's like true. I know you see it happen, and I'm walking with my head down, like I give a high five, whatever, and I, you know, I'm, but I'm not like quick. To, like it's not loaded up here. I'm thinking about did the ref call a blocker at charge? Like what's going? What's the time and score? What's the situation? I'm not thinking about celebrating. And I was having some tendonitis in my knee, so that takeoff was like, Ooh. Okay, that's fair. I felt that. I was like, <laughs> did, you, did you celebrate um, at that MSG, MSG buzzer beater? I yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, okay, so that's rare. So that was in a different, like, I was, I was in a different form. I was a different version of myself that day. I was highly angry in that game. And I usually don't play that emotional. That's the thing. I usually don't. I, I like to pride myself on being even keeled. Um, I think it's hard, you know, and I'm not like a naturally extremely angry person. So it's like, I feel like if I get into that rare form, it, it's, it's maybe not as sustainable, you know, I, but in that day is it ang- worked. Is ang- I, there's is some stuff happened in that game. You're, 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 cause this is, I'd diff- say no, this is different though. This is different yeah. because some guys, they have to be angry. They have to play mad. Right. Some guys, I'm not going to name names, uh, f- like basically force themselves to play that way. Right. And that's part of what makes them good. Right. 
Yeah. So your your flow state, your your flow state is just even keel. Yes. Right in the middle. Yes. No black and white. Right. I'm living in the gray. I'm right. all good. I'm good. Yeah. I'm locked in. I'm good. That Knicks game. Do you meditate? Was, yeah. You do? Yeah, but I, I've had my periods where I've done it every yeah, game. Yeah, I've yeah. had I've had fifty game stretches where I've done it. I've had fifty game stretches where I don't. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to hammer down the visualization the recipe. Do you yes, do, okay. yes. I sit on the bench after I shoot yeah. after I do my pregame shoot and I do my visualization. Yeah. Um, but that that New York game, the anger came from somewhere. You can't like it's it for me personally. I can't just manufacture out of nothing. Some people are really good at that. I can't manufacture out of nothing. There's a little little mishap early in the game and there was another little one and then there's a third one so i was just like levels like i'm pissed right now so i'm a, i was i was saying things i don't usually say you know i was just in a different mode so and you, my teammates you, can attest you had, to that what nine threes yeah so you, I, I don't remember the first half of the game so you did you turn up in the second half or were you, well, just... you okay so the first play when i got in the game i got a, like i got hit by julius in the rib mm. and like knocked the wind out of me and I remember Kale looked at me like I, I was on the ground trying to get up. But like, you know, you get the wind like that, it usually comes back quick. It was like, like, I was like, dang, like I'm. So he saw me like cross over, he calls the trainers over and I'm just sitting there like, I think I broke a rib, bro. And so I go get an x-ray. I'm cool. I, they said I had something with the cartilage. They gave me a pad, whatever. I come back in the game. I missed the whole entire first quarter. So I'm back in early in the second quarter. All right. Two, two, three possessions into the game, I go down the lane, like reject the pick and roll, just going for a layup. And, and Mitchell Robinson goes to block the shot. His knee hits my, my, my quad. And it was like, I got shot. Like, I was like, <laughs> bro, that, that did some damage. So that's, I've been in the game three minutes and I've taken two shots where I'm like, bro, this is crazy. So I'm sitting at, the, I missed my first free throw. And so I hit the second free throw. I'm like, all right, let's get back on track. Like I'm mad at this point. The the first shot that uh, that Julius gave me had me had me hot, and this one had me hot. So I'm going on through the game. I probably had like 12 points that quarter or something. You know, that's a, that's decent. You know, I've missed the first quarter. I'm you know I'm going into halftime with like 10, 12 points or something. But then in the third quarter, Julius and I had another little dust up. So I'm already angry. So I go to I like he's like trying to box me out or something, and I'm crashing the glass, and I try to hit him. You know, and he's big, so he's not moving much, but he knew I was trying to hit him. So he kind of gives me one back and then, you know, he gets in my face, whatever. I say something. I don't even know what I said. I can't remember. I said something and he got mad and kind of went at me again, which got him thrown out. So two texts, he gets two, I get one, I get to stay in the game, he leaves. And so I'm still turned up from this whole thing and we're down a little bit. So I'm just chucking threes and, you know, just riding that wave. It's amazing how a couple hits to the body or a, a quick conversation, a quick dust up with someone can get you going. Like there were times where if I got hit in the face. Yes, exactly. I'm now, you, I remember yeah, game. Like I was you, asleep, I was it, chilling Utah, before, but now I'm. It was like a game right after Christmas. I'm like, but we had a lot of games and a lot of time and the Joe Ingles hit me in the face. Yeah. And I was like, all right. Here's the thing, man. That, going. that knee from Mitchell, Mitchell Robinson did real damage though, is the issue. And it kept me out for weeks afterwards. Like I got home from the game and the adrenaline wore off. And I looked down and I had a sleeve over it. So I like take the sleeve out, I'm getting ready for bed. And I visually saw my leg swelling like in real time. And like they took the measurements, like it was so swole. Like it was, I got, yeah, I took a shot there. And then I play, I took the shot and then played 25 minutes on it afterwards. Did, so did you, did you feel like anger helped you at all? Like, I'm, 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 yeah, how did more, like, did, like anger and shooting, if it's a negative. I think I was probably well. closer to him where I, <clears throat> I was, it wasn't that I was like always Zen. It was just like laser focus. But like you, I you had a, I took you had a range. I took, took it so seriously. Right. But you have certain nights it's bound to happen in 82 games where my energy level's a little off. Like I'm not in that flow state. And, and so like JP Clark, you see assistant coach mm -hmm. with the Clippers with me. I remember one season, I think it was my second year there. Yeah. My second year I got off to a slow start, but like, Six, seven games, right? Just off right. to a slow start. Wasn't shooting a lot. Wasn't shooting well, whatever. And he came over to me. He's like, you know, he's like, I've watched you for a long time. You know, I remember last year and even with Orlando, like you always get yourself going when you're in a slump. If you take a charge, dive on the floor for a loose ball, like have a, have a conflict, right? Make, make a physical play somewhere. Like don't be a soft you know, shooter or whatever, you know, just like do something. And 
I thought about it. I was like, oh, dude, you're right. You're right. And then the rest of the season, I was one of my best years in the in the NBA. So I think I think sometimes it's like you do have to manufacture. Sometimes it happens organically, like yeah. when you do get hit or you get injured. I mean, you have to have edge to you. But like, like, yeah, you, I mean, I like, always had an edge, but it was like, right. just have certain nights where you're like, man, I just don't have it tonight. Oh, yeah, 82 games, that's bound to happen. I just don't have it. That's bound to happen. I was thinking, did you see the uh, the hype video Oregon put out about their game, the Colorado game from this no, weekend? What was it? it was basically, they put a video out about all the shit talking all the like Colorado it, players put were doing. It, they put it out today or yesterday. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that stuff. Yeah, I but, saw that stuff. But I just feel it's like it, it's an interesting thing, basketball versus football. We're like clearly in football, you, need, you have to. You need that. You need that. It's motivation. a barbaric game. Yeah, you need the motivation. But it's a lot like for mo many of the positions, it's not as you know. We, we have very very small margins in our game of like really particular fine movements. You know what I mean? Like shooting is a very particular movement. Like you 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 miss it. You miss your mark by an inch, and it's a missed shot. Yeah. So like football, you just turn it to the max and go like hit somebody hard, like you linemen, linebackers, like, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a different sport for sure. And I think, uh, you know, I didn't play football growing up, but I think there's some truth to what you guys are saying, <clears throat> but I, I, I would say this, like, just cause I, you know, I know some NFL guys or whatever, I'm sure you do too, but the, we have a processing speed that we have to be able to calculate in real time in the NBA, right. those guys do too. Like, it's not oh, just yeah. like, why oh, no, 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 no. But like, I'm saying from there's like a lot a, of, from just from a, like a, like they, like, I mean, we all seen football players bashing their heads off their helmets. Like they, they love to live in that space. Yeah. They love to live in that space. And, and football, football is, is an extremely technical game, but your job is much more straightforward. As if you're a corner, you're, you know, you're in cover two, you're this, you're not playing offense and defense rebounding. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's just, there's no, a there, lot of differences to the game. There's some freestyle av available, but there, there, you often just have, you, it's a t task. You have a, you have, you have a, task, a task, right? And you can like, you Lock put this guy and you put hundred percent of yourself into that yeah. task and then you get seconds to recover. By the way, we're doing this technical football to talk. I can't wait for yeah, let's hear it. Ryan, I just, Ryan yeah, Clark and I, 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 lo but I, I love the back and forth you guys between are sports. Idiots. I love the back and forth between sports because there's, I, I mean, when I'm speaking, it's never any shade. Like the respect oh, none, between, none. like when you get to the actual individual players, the respect between football players, baseball players, hockey players, basketball players is real because we all respect how much it takes to become what you are in your sport. So people love to like pit us against each other. Like, which one's harder? Who's the better athletes? And we're like, it's not about that. Our games are just different. Yeah. For sure. No, I, I once I got to the NBA, I was like, oh, I now respect every professional athlete. Right. Because, like, I understand what it takes. Um, Cam, before we let you go, I know we had a brief discussion last week. I want to follow up on this, uh, the, the, the shooting discussion. Yeah. And, I was waiting for this part. <laughs> and what we were, what we were talking about, and it ties into another question I had just about kind of where you see your game developing from here. Yeah. But you had mentioned to me that you've, been watching some some film of me specifically going right so yeah. turning over my right shoulder yeah um whether it's a throw and go a pin down dho whatever um and we got into a discussion and, I, and i'll just paraphrase here but essentially most shooters that move off the ball they like to go to their left mm -hmm. and i said corver was really good ray could do both but i think ray Mm -hmm. would because I guarded him and I knew which way I was trying to force him Ray like coming off the other side really like coming right left footwork going to his left um Steph does both I think Clay based on every ATO they run for him he likes going left right left footwork um what do you think what do you think so hard about going right versus the left because I of shoulders that's what it is it's the squaring of shoulders so anytime you're going left it's just so easy to turn that lead shoulder. But when you're going right, the shoulder, the arm that's shooting the ball is is actively away from the hoop. So then you have to ro rotate in order to square it with the hoop while maintaining speed. So the thing that I think you mastered, and you know, I'm sure you're very conscious of this, is that you allowed the process to happen. So you go right, and you're not like, let me stop my body, square my body, and then shoot. You do it as one continuous motion. So it's left foot right foot plant, elevate and rotate. Yeah. And so you jump without your shoulders being squared to the hoop and catch the square mid jump. So like you just basically perfect the timing of the turn. I wouldn't recommend 
teaching people how to well, do this. Like, yeah, it's this different. is not something yeah, it's you very, teach it's, a yeah, it's, Yes, exactly. Yeah. But like you just, you have an elite ability to shoot the ball. So you're able to time the release with the point in the rotation where your, your shoulders are square. Yeah. Right. I, so I think that's the main key to it. It's like, it's very hard because there's a lot of extra movement. Like that's why they tell you as a kid, don't fade away. You make it a moving target. Like when you're going right the way you do full speed and you're turning into that shot, you're going this way, rotating back the other way, and trying to find the point where to shoot the ball. Like it's a very acquired skill. So I had never heard that description or that that reasoning behind why it's harder because your shoulder is further away from the basket. You got to get it turning towards, your shoulder. Yeah. And I, it's funny the squaring part. I used to tell people this all the time. They'd be like, "Why do you like going over your left shoulder and going to your right so much more than the other side?" For me, it was simply a length issue. I'm six uh -huh. four with a negative uh -huh. wingspan. If my defender's on this side and I the can shoot on the move, away. the ball's further away. Coming this way, 100%. It's way easier to square coming to your left over your right shoulder. Way easier. The, that the, makes but, a lot of sense. But the yeah, yeah. But the description of the point at which I shot, and I think Kyle was a little bigger, so he, didn't, he did this really well, and Steph does it as well as anybody. Mm -hmm. But, like, I can remember nearly every shot that I made in the game. You know, Man, you watch, you we watch just a, got a log in our brains yeah. about it. So you see a clip of like a shot you made and when you watch it in full time, in like real time, like fast motion, whatever, not slow motion, you're like, huh, that shot looks a lot different than it feels. But then if, if I was to watch it in slow motion, the release point actually is when I'm fully square. Squared. Exactly. It's just, it but doesn't the timing look like of that it in is, real time. It has to be so precise. Yeah. It takes a lot of practice. You have a lot, and you have a, and, and I heard like, cause I, you know, Mont, you were with Mont, I was with Mont. I heard a lot about your routines. I heard you were one of the most routine shooters ever. And I, I think that plays into it. Like you were able to fine tune this certain type of shot because you had the attention to detail and the reps necessary to do it like that's why we like we wouldn't recommend just anybody go out and try to try to do this like it is yeah you and i need to be before you get going going i want to actually spend an hour with you in the gym and do some of the stuff but i i had i had a couple guys come out to sag harbor this summer to work yeah. on some stuff with me and i remember i'm not going to name his name because i really like him i think he's a good dude but i remember one of my coaches uh my rookie year it yeah. was before my rookie year and i was just I was shooting spot shots after practice. Yeah. And he comes over to me and he's like, you should plant your left foot before the ball goes there and then step with your right foot as you catch it and go up and shoot. That would essentially every, stop your momentum. Every single time. And I asked him, I said, no offense, but how many times in a season am I actually going to shoot that way? I might go five or six games without shooting with a left foot planted right foot. So when I shoot, when I would shoot spot shots, and this is what I, I drives me crazy when I watch guys shoot spot shots, they do the same footwork every time. Oh, I'm big on that. I'm every single spot shot I would shoot, and I, I didn't change shoot, it. I didn't I shoot change a it ton. Too. I shot a lot on the move, yeah. but it it like teaches your brain to just habitually and That's, naturally do your footwork differently on every shot. Because every time, like I come off a pin this way, you shoot the gap. I got to do something different with my feet. I don't have to think about I, it. Though. I get asked that question all the time, right? And I had a coach in college that was very stickler on left, right footwork. So we, we worked it, we worked it, we worked it. But over time I became of the mindset that you have to have them all and you have to have them all readily available because in a split second, you have to be comfortable choosing the one that's the most efficient, that gives you the best balance, that gives you the best elevation, that gives you the best chance of making the shot. So if I'm doing spot shots before the game, I'll go left, right, I'll go right, left, I'll go step, I'll, I'll step back toward uh, away from the hoop, I'll step, you know, on a jump stop or I'll just be feet planted. And my thought process is that I need all these in the game. I need to feel comfortable using any of these footworks at any given moment. So that's why I do it. It's not just, by the way, it's not just the muscle memory of, I don't want the muscle memory to happen for the first time in a game, right? right. It's, it's building up the muscle memory. Um, but it's also you, to your point, you can't predict which, what the timing is of a pass or whatever. And so you're building that in. Why is this all this important? Why is it all important? Because if I only practice one way and one thing is off, guess what? I'm not getting my shot off. Yep. I'm not getting my shot off. Nope. So yeah, I like, I, I just, it drives me crazy when I watch that. The one guy for me, so the, actually I see the two guys that footwork wise, 
Ray because I thought he was so, I thought he was good going every way. Yeah. But he also was really good, especially going to his left, so right shoulder turn on the hop. And so I started using hops like on my one dribble. Yeah. I start, you know, you're in space on a DHO and like I'd throw the ball out there and hop into it. Jamal yeah. did that uh, really yep, well too. Yep. And then the other guy that I watched, obviously watch a ton of still, but that I really, really dialed in, like by he was probably in year three at this point. It was like when I got to the Clippers, Clay's footwork when he fades on the right side of the court where he takes that like really exaggerated step with his right foot, it creates like an extra foot of space. Yeah. And then he just, you know, he's got the perfect form, right? Highly efficient, was, whatever. So I had, I, I had to practice that one a lot though. I had a coach in college and this was my last year at Pitt. We'd sit down and watch Clay's shots, Clay's threes, Clay's footwork. And then we go right to the court and practice what we just watched. So I, I'm in complete agreement with you there. Um, but man, I think that's I think that's the one thing about high level shooters like yourself, Ray. Um, there is there is a huge, and I know Ray talks about this. There's a huge emphasis on his base and his push off through the ground, which is really easy to you know keep in the back of your mind. If, but I think from everything that I've been told, guys that have played with him, things that he said, like the 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 jump the force with which he jumped was of utmost importance to him like yeah. getting off the ground planting his feet being balanced every time and and so that's something that i need to get better at and need to continue to to find is that like that consistency with force through the ground to get you into that really repeatable um shot motion because the one thing you don't want to do is give your upper body any more responsibility in determining how far you're shooting your left right like it you know you need to disperse as many of the uh, the variables as you can you know in in in, in very understandable chunks yeah i would say that the two guys in in today's game that like really jump out in terms of the base is dame and donovan mitchell Yep, Donovan Mitchell's base. I tell, I've tell him that's, this every like, season because of how he's built, right? He's I know, just like but a it's tank. it's just it's so good, bro. It's His lower perfect. body is are so there, good. Are there any? He stays low, and it is Dane's the same way though. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if we talked about this. Are there any young guys that you maybe they're not there yet consistently because you look at them, and you're like they're going to be at this level. I felt this just so you know. If you'd asked me this three years ago, I would have said Cam. And, and, and I'm not just the, saying. I that think an easy right, answer yeah. here for me is Trey because I. feel feel like as just a stationary catch and shoot shooter, he's elite. And as he adds more and more folds into his ability to shoot, like he can catch and shoot with the best of them. And he's going to continue to add more. He He's bigger than everybody. I think his capacity, his ceiling as a shooter is crazy high. Yeah. The, I, so I would give you a young guy I, I, and not just because he's a, uh, a white dude, but I actually really enjoyed watching him play last year. And he can shoot the shit out of the ball, but I really enjoyed him off the ball, his cutting, um, deception, all that stuff. And that's Corey Kispert from, from yeah. Washington. Yeah. Um, I think he's going to have a, a really good career. I, I'm, I'm excited to see him develop. That's a good one. Yeah. Before we, uh, before we get out of here, what are you most excited about this, uh, this fall? Uh, I think the thing I'm most excited about is to, is to see our team like establish our own identity. I think we have unique pieces. Like I think, you know, uh, Nick Claxton is a very unique center and his ability to run guard every position lob threat um, obviously ben allows teams to do especially guys like me and mikhail like he he opens the game up completely for us um and then you know spence doe roy we have very interchangeable like defensively we should be really really good um, but the fun thing about the season is being able to establish that identity, which last season was really hard given the, the circumstances. Like you're traded to a team mid-season, you're trying to figure out a lot on the fly. I think the most exciting thing is like really hammering out who we want to be as a team and then using those unique pieces that we have to our advantage. Did you feel, although you got traded yeah. from a team that had been in the finals, best record in the West the next year, and you get traded or an all-timer, and I'm sure that was emotional. But in some ways, were you energized by the opportunity to go from, call it a fourth or fifth option, maybe a tertiary option at times, 
on the Suns to one of the primary options with the Nets? Yeah, it's it's it, it's not that you're selfish. I'm not accusing you. Of no, being but selfish. it's a, like it's an amazing opportunity. Yeah. Like it's an amazing opportunity to continue to climb the ladder of the NBA. Like Mikhail and I talked about this all the time. Like we, we, it, they called us the twins be, just because we did all of our workouts together and our roles were pretty similar. And you know, that, that was that. And so we always talked about like, we don't have any qualms about our role in Phoenix because we love to win yeah. and our team was winning, but we're like, yeah, like, like we, we really, we really got more stuff. So we worked on it every day. We really got more stuff, you know, like Tatum and Brown, like that's an elite wing though. It's like, yeah, like we, we're going to keep working. You know what I mean? Maybe we're like maybe a low usage version, three and D version. <laughs> we always would joke around about that, but the, the, the opportunity to go to a team and then continue to take those steps in the very natural steps, um, you know, as our career, it's not like a forced step. Um, is like amazing. How often does that happen where you, you have the ability to play on such a great team, learn, you know, and, and, and get transferred to another really high level organization where you're just able to continue growing your game. And Mikel is a huge event, uh, a huge example of that. Like, that's what I point to when everybody asks like, Oh, Mike, did he, he just completely changed. Like, where did that come from? Where I was like, no, he's worked on this stuff for five years. He's had opportunities with all these injuries to continue to implement it into his game and then boom, completely ready to take advantage of the opportunity in Brooklyn. Got to be ready. Got to be ready. All right, Cam, last question. The Roback question, a reminder to our viewers that you can use the code old on Roback.com for 20% off your first purchase. R-H-O-B-A-C-K.com code old. Uh, and we're going to give you some gear afterwards too. I've already set aside an Excel performance hoodie for you. Um, wear this uh, all the time. And hopefully, I'm really hopeful this week's rowback question does not get us into any trouble with any fan bases on Twitter. All right, Cam, who has had the most influence on your game and career? The most influence on my game, I'd have to say my dad. I have to say my, my dad, my parents as a whole, um, as a unit. Um, and I think it's they from day one, not only they were players, you know, my mom played at Kent State, my dad played at Pitt, so they were knowledgeable about the game, but they gave me every opportunity to be successful, whether it be high level training, whether it be, you know, information from other players. Um, and that's something that I like, I like can't be overlooked. Like I look back at, at my life, at my career and, you know, they just gave me every, every advantage possible to be successful. And I can't thank them enough for that. Um, and then you add in the fact that they, they do kind of know what they're talking about when they talk to me about stuff. It's, you know, built, you know, and, and as players, it, it gets annoying sometimes, you know, here in, you know, it's the same voice over and over again, but the stuff I've been able to take from them and and the positions that I've been able to be in, I owe it all to them. Yeah, you want your parents if you want to be an NBA player, you want your parents to be athletic and tall. Yes, but only have reached a certain level of basketball. Boom, so that they can parent you, but not just like to an overbearing extent on Boom. your game. I told you the other night at dinner, my dad, biggest fan, like biggest supporter. My, my hero, the only thing he would ever text me when I was going through a slump, don't forget about your mid-range. Don't forget about your mid-range. I love it. Don't you love it? My I mom, it. get more rebounds. That's what she says. Get more rebounds. <laughs> yeah, I love and it. And my, my, it's funny because my dad would definitely say, get, get to the mid-range. <laughs> I'll be like, okay. Tommy, it's a conflict-free this is, answer. This is, a, this is a conversation for the next next time you come on. We're, we're going to go for a new dad talk. <laughs> yeah. All right. This has been the Roback question. Uh, make sure you go to get yourself some Roback gear now, Roback.com. Use code OLD. Um, all right, Cam. It's been awesome stuff, man. Of course, man. Thank you for having appreciate me. I appreciate the time. It. Yeah, we can talk about shooting all day, man. Yeah. But we do. Let's get in the gym, bro. Let's do it.